It's the, the, the human interactions, that's the human side is the most important piece. It, it's, it's what my specialty is. And, and now that I do corporate counterintelligence, I, my specialty is the human side. It's helping companies to understand that it's their humans are both their greatest strength and their greatest weakness. If you don't empower them and you don't train them, then they can be your greatest weakness. If they're empowered and trained, then they become naturally intelligent sensors that can observe the environment, report back into the system, and and we can develop a picture of what's happening and counter any potential threats. More than 90% of data breaches are caused by, or or have, go back to a human. There's a human cause. That's Kent Kilsby, a former CIA case officer and expert in credibility assessment. I'm Jason Blair. This is the Silver Linings Handbook bonus episode. This is a bonus episode that was a part of a YouTube live conversation we had with our March 2023 guest, Kent Kilsby, a former CIA case officer and expert in credibility assessment. In this bonus, we discuss some of the questionable interrogation methods that have led to false confessions Myths About Detecting Deception, Kent's new book called Holistic Contextual Credibility Assessment, How You Can Assess Credibility in Your Everyday Life, Machine Learning and AI in Deception Detecting, and Why a Street Kid from Baltimore Might Make the Best CIA Case Officer. In the full-length episode available on our YouTube channel, We also discuss case studies Kent covers in his book involving our failures to detect double agents from East Germany and Cuba, some of the challenges that the CIA faces in hiring people with street smarts, why institutions and agencies have a hard time giving up on some of the myths around deception detection found in places like the television show Lie to Me. I want to give a special thanks to our listeners for their great comments and their great questions. What's really cool is I already have uh, some listener questions uh, that have already come in, but I'm going to go ahead and get started just by Asking a little, you know, mentioning the interesting story of how we first met. It was back in August 2009. Um, I was working as a life coach in Ashburn, Virginia, newly rebuilding my life after the time scandal. And, you know, I get this email. And at first, I'm like, this is spam, clearly. Or this is someone trying to punk me. Or what kind of what, what kind of scam is this? But if you want to go ahead and tell the story, you tell it much better than I do. <laughs> well, I, so I was sending spam one day, and I thought I'd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I. Oh, sorry, Jason. That um, explains a lot. I, of- I was, I was working at uh, for a a company that we were doing training for defense intelligence agency uh, human intelligence collectors. I had just taken over a module in that long course on deception detection. It was it was a mess. And as we'll, we, you'll probably hear from me later in this uh, discussion that uh, U.S. government deception detection is generally speaking absolutely horrible. Uh, it's worse than horrible. And the, the track record goes back decades and decades and they just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again, not learning from from mistakes. Uh, but I took over the deception detection module, and it had been 
uh, taught by a, an FBI agent who is now very prominent in deception detection and has got his PhD in psychology or, or something. Oh, Eckler? I'm, I'm not going to mention any okay. names. <laughs> no name names. <laughs> and uh, he was... He was just filling these poor kids, uh, poor students with with nonsense, uh, talking about. Uh, I mean, he he would do just he I gave sort of demonstrations. I sat in his courses as I was taking it over, and it was just really, really bad. He would at, at the end of of this module with, that he was teaching, they would go away with nothing useful for their jobs. Their jobs were to go out and meet people and assess them of, and, and recruit them as sources of foreign intelligence. And to do that, you're face to face with someone having a discussion, talking to them, getting to know them. And, um, nothing that the Bureau that traditionally uses has any any relevance to that that sort of skill set and that sort of intelligence human intelligence cycle so i started the bureau the bureau is really focused on investigating things interviewing well, well, interrogation, what, yeah, interrogating effect, interrogations yeah. really you know what what they're using you know they what they think they're they're doing a deception detection is uh, they sit down with someone even if the person's not under arrest they, they've already flashed their badge, flashed their gun, and said they're from the FBI. So whether you're innocent or guilty, you're immediately terrified. Oh, shit, I'm screwed. Yeah, I've got like an FBI agent on my case here, and he's talking to me. The FBI has trained these uh, their, their agents that they're building rapport in this, that in, as they sit down. Dude, only one, only only somebody who's been on the non-shiny side of the FBI, FBI badge thinks them showing up is building rapport. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, if if you've never been in the situation of being questioned by a federal law enforcement agent who's just flashed his badge and showed you his gun, uh, if if you haven't been in that situation, you have no idea what. The subject is feeling and the agents haven't been in that situation. So they're they're thinking they're building rapport and and observing a baseline of physical responses or something. And it's all total nonsense. And and then in their questioning, they're uh, they're creating cognitive load or or some such silliness. And it is totally useless for a, a human intelligence um, uh, interaction when when you're doing when you're developing a relationship with someone that you want to that that, that your your goal is to build a relationship so that they trust you and that they will share uh, secrets with you that that's that's what a, a human intelligence relationship is all about. So I I had ha having I'm sorry. What's that, Jason? I was saying. So why me? <laughs> so well well I'm I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So that's what I took over. So it was totally broken. I took over a totally broken deception detection module. So I had to totally rebuild it in, in a in reality, in, in a reality-based, okay, here's what we do as human intelligence officers. Um and, and here's here here is a skill set and some knowledge that can help you in uh, trying to detect deception, which which I quickly realized you can't detect deception. You can assess credibility and and make and make a good or a bad assessment, and you can build skills and knowledge that helps you to assess credibility. So as I rebuilt this module, one of the my, and and I'm an instructional designer also, so I I think like and facilitator. So I think like an instructional designer, which is we're looking for learning objectives, and then we create, um, we, we create, uh, um, we you, you introduce the concepts, and then you create experiences that allow your learners to practice the skills and concepts, and then they practice them again, and then they're evaluated and they get feedback. So I was 
looking for different ways of introducing the concepts of deception detection. And I was doing a lot of research and looking at case studies. And I, I had known of, of your case, Jason, of your experience at the Times. And I, it, it suddenly hit me. Wow, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be eye-opening and mind-blowing, really, for people who are trying to assess credibility or detect deception to hear from a, a someone who has practiced deception, Absolutely. who has and carefully also had the other job of sussing it out. So. Having been on exactly. both sides of it, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, so you're you're not only a not only a, a great case study of a successful practitioner of deception, but you now, as you, ha having gone through the experience that you went through of uh, of being exposed, being found out, and then developing building on that personally building your personal make, make, making making lemonade out of the lemons that you had uh you, you now have this unique insight into this whole um th this whole idea of, of of being deceptive and how that might be uh how, how that deception might be detected and how someone could have or should have assessed your credibility when you were uh when, when you were fabricating the stories that you fabricated that was my idea long story short didn't work out there's too many too many bureaucratic hurdles, uh, hurdles. all kinds of mm -hmm. things but mm -hmm. but so so that that's that's what drove my uh I, I reached out to you we we got in contact and we started getting together and me and you had had a lot of great ideas to work on that project, but it never came to fruition. Well, because, you know, an interesting thing during that time for me, after the times, obviously, I had a lot of time on my hands, had a lot of, you know, mental health rehab to do, but it was in the heart of the war on terror. And the run up to the Iraq war, uh, all sorts of, well, not the run up, it was actually the aftermath, as we were starting to find out more about it. So I had a lot of time to read and pay attention to things. And you eventually had things like the coast bombing that happened much later in Afghanistan. In each of these stories, I kept on noticing this common thread, and I don't think it was just the CIA. Applied to the FBI, applied to the DIA, it applied to others, um, of things that felt for me like obviously things that should have been assessed more, or like clearly no one spent any time thinking about this person's motives or they were being too rosy or too optimistic, or they were relying on like ancient techniques. Like, you know, and I had clients at the time who were working for contractors for the agency, and they were being sent off to these like lie to me courses where they were supposed to pay attention to micro expressions and things like that. And I just thought to myself, like, if this is how we're making policy decisions, like, we are in trouble. Because yeah, so, were, so I, yeah. I, I, I didn't get deeper into that, but yeah, that was another thing I found when I was uh, uh, taking over that uh, deception detection module is the the government was paying for these Paul Ekman. Uh, it's a scam. The whole micro expressions thing is a total scam. There is no zero evidence. Ekman has never detected deception using micro expressions. He's written academic articles. Uh, he, he, the the entire thing is based on a wrong theory of of cultural universality of uh, expressions mm -hmm. meaning the same thing in every culture and always meaning the same thing. Which is just if you've ever been immersed in another culture, you know that's total BS nonsense. But he had built this whole thing on all of these misconceptions and his own his own deception really yeah. and the government was paying and and when i took over this course they were they were paying for students to take the ekman ekman courses totally useless just a, another example of 
Well, because it doesn't really, like you're saying, take into that cultural context or the individual context. Because I've I've had this conversation with you, I've had it with other people. But one of the things over time I've learned in interviewing people as a journalist, interviewing people as a clinician, and even in the times where people call me in to interrogate, like I'm on the board of a nonprofit and they thought their executive director was lying. And they were like, Jason's a perfect person for this. He's not a lawyer. He is very nice. He will get a baseline of what the person's behavior is and see when they operate outside of that baseline. And, you know, I was able to make an assessment. My job in that position was actually to box the person into a story so they could later look into the story. But in all of this, it was very individual. Like, I could not have walked into the room with that woman and made any assessment on my own without a ton of history of having been around her, worked with her, heard her, engaged her. So, you know, I I, I definitely have tells when I'm lying, but I don't think you could guess what they were, Um, you know. And and I think like the individual element, same thing with my clients, like some people tap their feet all the time. Some people stare up all the time. Some people, when they're looking me in their eyes, I know they're lying to me, but that's because I know them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I, and and Unfortunately, uh, although if you do it right, that can be useful baselining someone. But that said, it's very, very difficult to 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 figure out what baseline means mm-hmm. and uh, what it is. Bottom line, what it what it boils down to is there are no reliable ways of assessing credibility or detecting deception based on any physiological signs. Yep. That is any measurement or observation of eyes, mouth, hands, legs, feet, blood pressure, breathing, heart rate. None of those can, you know, you can measure them all. And that's why they, that's why we do, because we're, you know the 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 american the, the us government especially is they want something easy and it's why easy in love to with measure the measure stuff right it's a exactly i'm yeah and i'm that, not going to mention things in in particular but anything that measures physiology does not have a correlation to lying there is yeah. no physiological measurement that correlates to lying well cuz one of the i mean you know, to that point, when I say baseline, I certainly don't mean physiological because, you know, people behave different based on how much water they've had by, you know, whether they had caffeine that day, whether they went and worked out at the gym, you know, it, it's got to be a bigger picture piece of it. And like the baseline that you often talk about is you first, you have to understand the culture, right? Like that's the beginning piece of it, whether you're looking at something physical or their words or does this make sense, right? Does this credibly make sense? And I think that it's so, I think, complicated to understand other people's cultures. People have a hard time understanding their own. That, to your point, they want a simple way to do it. But, you know, I am absolutely convinced that I could beat the polygraph in either direction. Like, I could come in and tell you the absolute truth and blow the polygraph. And I'm pretty sure of the other way around. Uh, You know, like... And I've been interviewed, and when I was interviewed for my clearance, I thought the most effective approach that anyone used, because they kept on, as you can imagine with my background, sending the investigator back over and over again for more conversation. And I remember telling the guy one, I'm like, this is really good. I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to make me care about how you feel about me, and you're trying to reinforce for me that the truth matters, right? And that- uh, The building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, it's really beautiful rapport building. Luckily, I was planning on telling you the truth anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So one of our listeners asked a question about, um, it's Michael Ely, who's the host of um, his own recent YouTube uh, legal roundup called Just Legal History, which I recommend to everybody. Um, he had a question about your thoughts about the read technique, which is the method 
um, that is very sort of common in law enforcement of putting high pressure on an interviewee, followed by offers of sympathy, then understanding, and then help. Some people have argued it's led to self, you know, uh, it's led to some wrongful confessions and other problems like that. But it's basically that push and pull of like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of like put all the heat on you, then pull it off and make, uh, make uh, me your small window to get out of this heat that I'm causing for you. I always thought it kind of fits within what you said before in the sense that there's already enough pressure when you're being interrogated just by the fact that you're being interrogated. No need to turn it up. Any thoughts on that for you, Kent? Oh, oh, absolutely. The, 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 the traditional, whether it's read technique or there's the, the sort of traditional police law enforcement uh, interrogation methodology has resulted in many, many, many false confessions. You, you get somebody in a, an interrogation room, they may be chained to the floor. You know, the, the, the intel community used the same kind of techniques uh, uh, you know, when, when they had, uh, d- during the war on terror, when they had uh, interrogation facilities around the world. But you, you're, you have somebody in custody. The door is locked. The, the interviewer is sitting there with guns. You've got cameras on them. You, as the subject, know that you're in trouble. These people uh, may or may not throw me in jail tonight, or maybe they just pulled me out of jail to have this conversation mm-hmm. where they're building rapport <laughs> and, and building a baseline. I, I might be chained to the floor. I might be handcuffed. I might be uh, handcuffed uh, to, the to, table. The wall, wow. to the table. And the, so, so it's total control. You have, you have the, the interrogator has total control, has control over your life and, and your future from this moment for the rest of your life. And they can the the, the traditional techniques, re, including read, uh, use that control to manipulate the subject. So it's a you're, you're manipulating a totally powerless person. And the the techniques, you know, they 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 talk about building rapport, observing a baseline. It's all that's nonsense. You can't build rapport with somebody who's naked, chained to the subject, floor. right? Like. Well, what, what is the baseline of somebody who's j- you just pulled him out of prison, took a bag off his head, chained him to the floor, and and what what, what does the baseline even mean? It, right. it's, it's it's ridiculous. That's the beginning of it. As as you go through the technique, your it's threats. It's dude, we know you did it. You did it. Just tell the truth. Tell me how you killed her. Mm-hmm. And. And as people's anxiety goes up, they'll do anything to get it to stop. So they'll they'll tell you whatever it takes to get it to stop. It goes hours and hours and hours. I, I've I've looked at so many case studies of this with, and and it's very effective on inexperienced people, mentally challenged people, and kids. So you you know uh, you know any inexperienced, but especially kids. I mean, there's like cases of thirteen year old kids confessing to mass murder of their family when, you know, 10 years later, DNA or something exonerates them. But you have, the, you look at the interrogations, you look, and they confess, they confess and tell them, they tell the, the cops, whatever it is they want to know. After, uh, mentally ill kids. And what was the third? In, inexperienced people, inexperienced. people who, you know, it doesn't work on uh, criminals uh, intelligence mm-hmm. officers, ex- mm-hmm. uh, experienced, uh, especially foreign intelligence officers, uh, you know, Russians, Chinese, Cubans, that kind of thing. Uh, they, they have, they're, they're trained to deal with this. They, they can, they don't care about, they, they, they're laughing at these, at these silly techniques. Uh, there, there's case studies, the, uh, East Germans, the Cubans, both, uh, intelligence off that, that the, the CIA had had to stable 
dozens of them. Every single one was bad. So mm-hmm. all they, they, I, I doubt if the read technique was used on them, but they used physiological deception detection, and they had all been they'd all passed these these uh, deception detection uh, yeah. uh, tests. But yeah, the the read technique or and any other really what it's what what's custodial. Custodial interrogations are extremely coercive and not not a good way to uh, to to get at the truth. I what think they think? have. I, I know, especially to Europe, has they have a new technique, and I'm not familiar with names. Can't tell you off the top of my head, but they've made it uh, the read technique and coercive interrogations illegal. They can't use them, mm. so they have uh, approaches that are more like my approach of assessing credibility, building a, a holistic picture of, uh, of, of, of the subject and, and understanding what's going on. Peace. That's it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's, and, and it's, it's less, less or not coercive. I'm not totally familiar with it, but yeah. Yeah. Well, technique is it, terrible. Terror. It, it's unethical and should be illegal. As a journalist, we did not have the opportunity to uh, put handcuffs on people, <clears throat> although I'm sure many people wanted to put handcuffs on us. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, what What I always found was, you know, usually the best way to get people talking is to create sort of like a safe space for them. Doesn't mean that the person isn't going to lie to you. So you also have to look at what is this person's motive? So I've got to interpret whatever they're saying through whatever their motive is or whatever I can discern about their motive to talk to me. But I've always found when you get people to the point where they forget they're being interviewed, you have a much better chance. And in a custodial situation, it's really hard to ever get to that, get to that. Point. And so what you're describing is a conversation. Yes. That's to, to, to elicit and gather details. Um, my approach, holistic contextual credibility assessment uh, is all about Gathering details, gathering facts that under, but you have to understand the context that these facts and and the subject is working in. If you don't understand the context, you have no uh, no no ability to 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 assess what you're gathering. And in these conversations, you're gathering details, you're gathering facts that you can. Think of it, really Sherlock Holmes, if you're familiar with his approach from all the movies and, and, and stories, uh, is, is very much applying a uh, holistic, uh, contextual uh, ap- approach to assessing credibility. The only thing that's, that's really unreal about the Sherlock Holmes approach is he is, a, he is an expert in every context that he stumbles into right correct correct (laughs) which is very difficult to be uh and and that's part of my hcca is we practitioners have to self-assess and realize the context that Mm. we are competent or not competent in yeah and and by i mean essentially the idea being if you are going to interrogate people if you are going to assess their credibility like being self-aware, knowing what your potential blind spots in that conversation are, even being able to say, hey, maybe I'm not the right one for this one, or exactly. we're going to be limited by this. I can do it for yeah. you, but we're going to have to make these assumptions or whatever it may be. be- better to better to find someone who is competent. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it, if yes, if you can't find someone who's competent in that context, then Going into it, knowing that you're not competent, what you have to do is to study up and try to become competent in the context. The, the easiest way to, to visualize this and to think about it is cultural contexts. That is, any kind of uh, physiological measurement that, uh, that is claimed to work anywhere in any culture is total nonsense. It ain't going to work. But a holistic contextual approach doesn't work either. If you're an American who grew up uh, in Vermont 
And now you have gotten, you know, you're you're a cop or you're an intelligence officer, and you still your only competence that you have is uh, it, uh, cultural competence is uh, Vermont. Now you suddenly are dropped into Yemen. Yeah, it's not going to work in Miami, much less Yemen. Or exactly. So, so I'm I I I want to start with the the country uh, culture. You know, you're you're that that's very obvious. You go from Vermont into Yemen and you have no idea what these guys, even if even if there's not a a, a language barrier, you say you speak their language or they speak your language. You still do not understand the context, the the culture much. And and once you grasp that, then you can make the 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 uh, analogy to subcultures within the U.S., that guy from Vermont is not going to be able to drop into New Orleans and uh, have a conversation and with any and, and be able to assess with any accuracy uh, the the facts that he gathers there. That makes complete sense. Do you see everyday application for these kinds of approaches in people's day to day lives. Like, you know, I think to myself, like, let's take me as an example, baseline. I'm fairly naive. I will let anybody in. I uh I'm the last, you know, my friends are like the first people to be like, I just met that person. They're a bad person. A year from now you're gonna know. And I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. Um, I'm good once I get a clue, once I get a scent, and once I can go after things. So for you know, for those of us who are sort of like thinking about it within our own contexts, where we have the upside of both being experts and blinded by what's in front of us, are there things that we can use, like with its, whether it's spouse, kids, dog, whatever it is we're, we're trying to assess, our bosses, our company, you know? Uh, I, I, I guess probably the, the, the best, if you're asking for my advice, uh, my advice, probably the most valuable would be first, you got to turn off all of these charlatans who are bombarding our culture, our popular culture with uh, six ways to tell if if they're lying. First, they're looking to the right and they're crossing their legs and they make eye contact or don't make eye contact or look for the micro expressions. That's that is I, I I would guess the for the normal person that is the biggest hurdle to being able to assess credibility. You're constantly bombarded with these uh, with, with these uh, techniques that that don't work. No, there's no physiological signs that show people are lying. So that's the first first step you got to make is ignore all of that. If you're able to do that, and if you're able to wipe your mind clean of that idea that you should be looking for something uh, in the physiology, if you're able to do that, then the next step is to think like Sherlock Holmes, gather, have conversations, gather details, gather facts, assess logically. And one other thing I, I didn't mention is so there, there's logic and there's also intuition. Intuition plays a huge role. <laughs> uh, as somebody said I blinked three times, so I might be lying. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There, no, no, there's no, there, there are no blinking. There's no licking your lips. No, none of that means anything. So, so use your logic, gather facts and details and, and use logic to assess them. But also, if you are competent in the context you're dealing in, listen to your gut. Listen to intuition. Your intuition is just a subconscious summary of the whole of your experience in, in this context. It's in, your, your brain is working. Your mind is working in the background, even though you're not aware yeah, of it. And suddenly something pops up. People often think that like intuition is not based on anything. And I once had this, uh, I forget whether it was, was it a psychiatrist or neuro neurologist? It was a psychiatrist. Explain it to me like this. I thought, 
It's like when you meet a new person for the first time and they walk through the door, your body, your mind is analyzing a million things about them so fast that you cannot even possibly process them. And that is what your intuition is. It is exactly. working on subjective and objective evidence. Just so. Yeah. Cool. yeah. And, and, and again, though, you've got to be competent in the context, the cultural context that that uh, encounter is occurring in. If you've got your kid from Vermont in Yemen, a Yemeni tribesman walks in, if I'm I'm competent in in Yemen the Yemeni context, I can tell the thobe he's wearing tells me uh, what tribe he's from. I can tell by the length of his robe what his religious outlook is. I can tell by whether he's carrying a prayer beads. Uh, if he you, you look at uh, stains around his mouth to see if he chews chat. There's so many things that. The Vermont kid has no clue. He looks at the guy and goes, oh, yeah, it's an Arab. Oh, my God, he's going to blow us up. You know, to talk, because he's incompetent. He right. has no competence in that context. So his intuition means nothing. It is worse than nothing. It is dangerous. And, and uh, no matter what his gut tells him, it's, got, it's not going to be right. And, and And if he is sort of right, then he he's missing a huge chunk of it. Yeah, intuition is a powerful and useful, but you got to realize uh, it, it's it's, it's a piece of the holistic contextual approach. Yep. And it's and if you don't have uh, experience or expertise in the context in which you're working, your intuition is worse than useless. It's going to be dangerous, right? Even more dangerous. It's gonna be dangerous. Than that context. And that's why you should yeah, either for you or for the subject. Yep. I was thinking about the credibility assessment piece of it in the book. And I was just thinking more broadly, like whether it's the conversation we were having before about false confessions or people like Curveball, who was this uh, spy that they had in Europe or no, no, asset that was in Europe who, um, who fed information to the U.S. and British government about weapons of mass destruction that ended up being false because he wanted asylum. Or you think about things like the coast bombing where a bunch of uh, CIA officers and contractors, including one that we knew, were killed, not we, as in me and Bonnie, knew, you know, were killed. A lot of it comes down to... It, and this is probably true about corporate espionage and assortment of other things or broken marriages, um, not really being able to assess the credibility of what's in front of you. And I'm just curious, like, what are some of the consequences, big and small, if we don't start thinking about it in a different way? Well, actually, Coast is, uh, I, I, I include in this book uh, hmm. several case studies of the consequences of government's approach to detecting deception. And Coast is the shining example of that. The the asset in Coast, the the recruited asset in Coast, that everybody, this is this is the highest speed, most important penetration of Al Qaeda. This we're this is kick ass. This is badass human intelligence. So, so that's that was all part of their the the assessment of him, the vetting of him was that he was he did did have high level connections uh, in in uh, had access to 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 management, uh, if you will, of, of Al Qaeda and other groups. But but the bottom line is that and the the point that I make in my book, and when we talk about this as a case study of abysmal failure of credibility assessment, cases hum, cases human asset cases do not get more high level than this guy. So you would think that a uh, intelligence agency would use the best possible vetting and credibility assessment approaches. For somebody like this, and they did, they used what they had that that they think is 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 the best. And but 
you know, they haven't learned over decades and decades of failures that that approach doesn't work. And post again shows the bottom line for those who don't know that the asset was from the first day he met with the CIA at double agent. He was working directly for uh, Al Qaeda and terrorist organizations before and and his goal was to kill CIA officers as many as possible before he went to the meeting in which he he wore a uh, suicide vest and, and killed seven CIA officers and a variety of other people as well uh, he before he went to that meeting on, on his way he recorded a, a a video his last will and testament and he he explained why he was doing what he did and what the agency had done uh, in, in recruiting him. And he talked about they paid me millions of dollars. I sp and, and he says, I spit on your money. You, you think that I'm motivated my, by money. I have no interest in your money. Total failure of understanding the context, this guy's context. And the one interesting thing I always found out about that story it, when you had, you know, made that those points to me about context, that the two people who really got freaked out at the last moment, who both ended up dead, were the guy who's a former Navy SEAL who was not a CIA officer and was a security contractor and a former Green Beret. Their alarms went up because the story didn't make sense. Them all grouping themselves together to greet him with a cake did not make sense. Like everything to them, to your point about intuition was saying, this does not feel right. And so those guys, they, their gut is, is so they, they, uh, their career has been based on being in dangerous situations and being able to feel what, when it's going bad. So that's their contextual competence. So they and, and may, they may have some cultural competence too, a little less likely, but but they they likely have some contextual competence, especially the the special forces guys. But they their gut told them this ain't right. This Something's ain't right, man. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that these aren't the only failures that have occurred between 1960 and and today and 2010 or 2024 yeah so so i i had uh, when, you know when i talk about what uh, uh what's required to do this job right a lot of it is looking at why i i was good at it <laughs> and and i was good at it because i had street sense because i'd been on the street i'd been running from the cops i've been caught by the cops <laughs> i i i'd been I, I was used to playing roles. I was used to changing uh, character, sort of changing characters. I was used to kind of the shady side of the street. I didn't spend a lot of time doing that, but it was enough years that, uh, you know, by the time I joined the military when I was 20, uh, if, if I hadn't joined the military, I'd have been either dead or in prison within a couple of years. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I learned, I, I, I saw the light and said, dude, you can do better than this. And I joined the military and, and changed my life. But those, those year, few years of developing the street sense, um, really are very value, were very valuable in my job. And, um, I, my, I, in the military, I was, I was a linguist and I spent time overseas and I developed the ability to immerse myself in a culture and become competent in that culture pretty quickly. Uh, that again was because of my, uh, my, my street sense and my ability to talk to anybody and deal with any situation that I had developed by being on the sort of shady side of life for a few years, which made me very, very uh effective once i was in my job but i think that it's also a threat to the bureau bureaucracy hmm. because when there are very few people like that uh with that kind of background hmm. um they it's outside the mold right there's not outside the mold and and effective 
And when others uh, see that effectiveness and they're not able to achieve that, it's like you know, they sort of, mm-hmm. you know, the bureaucracy spits you out. You don't, you don't fit. And did you, you came back after 9-11? Is that right? Do I have that right? Do I remember that right? Was it after 9-11? When 9-11 happened, now there was a clear mission and I was ready to use my skills. And I knew that there would be a, 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 a shorter or longer period where the bureaucracy didn't really matter. It was going to be the mission that mattered. And that's what happened after 9-11, probably about five years, maybe even a little shorter, but maybe three or four years where all that mattered was the mission. And that was fantastic. So I went back as a contractor and uh, uh, worked around the world doing counterterrorism contracting work. Tell the story of, uh, you know, post you leaving the agency and ending up uh, out on your own. And I don't know if I ever told you about it. I don't think we had talked about Wayne Simmons, but we hadn't been in touch in a while. And one day I picked up the New York Times my good old favorite newspaper, truly still my favorite newspaper. <laughs> and I'm like, why is there a giant picture of Kent look into the sky <laughs> on this front page article? And so then I found the story of Wayne Simmons. I was like, wow, he's really outdone himself this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In what we talked about into play. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so Wayne Simmons was a commentator on Fox News. Uh, he was for 13 years. They they featured him as one of their main commentators on the CIA counter uh, counterterrorism uh, and and related kind of subjects. He they they featured him as a former uh, CIA operations officer, and uh, and he would opine in great depth and detail on any issue that came up and he was voluble loud he was uh he he had very uh his opinions were very much in sync with the neoconservative sort of fox news uh angles and he was everywhere all the time i didn't have cable tv and i didn't uh, i i had never seen him uh, but I, I found this out later. Uh, mm. A friend of mine, a mutual friend who who knew Simmons and knew me, said, "Hey, Kent, you you really got to meet Wayne. You two are so much alike. You know, you have both the same background. Uh, yeah, he's a great guy, and he's got there's all kinds of stuff going on, and maybe you can do business with them or something." So he set up a uh, set up a, a lunch uh, mm. with us three. And um, like that so I, <laughs> yeah, so I, I went to went to the lunch, sat down, shook his hand, and within three to five minutes, I knew this dude is full of shit. Huh. He well, is well. So if if you if you think of it in terms of holistic contextual credibility assessment, it's the context. I mean, I'm I an expert. I remember sitting down with a guy once, and he said. He said he was from what I call the NSA, and he referred to it as the NSA in the conversation. And I was like, no, everybody who's there calls it NSA without the the in it. And I instantly knew, like, this guy's full of shit or he's tangentially connected to it because he's not he's speaking the way I would talk about it, not the way that somebody on the inside would. So. And, and that's con- you had contextual knowledge yep. there. Yep. You had, yep. and, and same thing. I have contextual knowledge of being a CIA counterterrorism case officer. And uh, he, nothing he said made sense. Nothing he said, everything, all of the, he started telling stories about his operations and the, the unit he worked for and uh, taking, taking down $90 million of Coke in Miami and, you know, blah, blah. You, yeah, me and you know about that, don't we, Kent? You were like, wrong country, buddy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's, and, and, and anything else he said, nothing uh, in, in the con, 
my contextual uh, expertise told me there is nothing this guy is talking about that's real. Do people I didn't tell him you? that, and I didn't oh. tell huh? Oh, yeah, I was going to, that's exactly what I was going to ask. Did you? Yeah, did so you I, I didn't mention that to him, and I didn't mention it to my buddy, but I walked out of there saying, I'm going to find out who the hell you are, and I'm going to expose you. Uh, well, I, I, think, I didn't walk out of there saying, I'm going to expose you. I walked out of there saying, you ain't going to blow smoke up my butt, buddy. Because the only thing that pisses me off in the world nowadays is somebody trying to Why do uh, Somebody trying to, to to play me for a fool. Mm. You lie to me, okay, but don't play me for a fool. And this is playing me for a fool. He thought mm. he can totally, totally blow smoke up my butt, and I'm going to walk away smiling. Yeah, I'm going to do business with you. Because you're on, you're on, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> it's always one of the things that I wondered about with the case. I've reading about it. Like, you're not the only person from the CIA who is watching, you know, there are plenty of people watching Wayne Simmons on TV. Fox News is on in the place all the time. Um, Exactly. So what, I mean, they had to also notice this sounds like it makes no sense. Or Uh, some, well, so, so that, that's another case study in my book is Wayne Simmons is Mm -hmm. why was it me? So, so why I left there and I began vetting him, I began, you know, figuring out, you know, what the hell, what the hell is this unit he's talking about? He worked for what the things is it? Is it something that I'm just totally out of the loop on? And I, I started gathering more details, doing a holistic uh, look at him, and I found out that many ex agency people knew him, knew of him, but none of them were willing to say. And this, but he's a fraud. He's fake. Some of them would say, "Yeah, you know, I didn't, I didn't know uh, about the stuff he was talking about." But you know, a lot of times that happens. Um, you know, we we work in different silos, and we yeah. we may not be totally aware, and that's absolutely right. But still, you you can tell when someone, uh, it, it, I, I can tell because of, I I apply holistic contextual credibility assessment. I can tell. All I can say, Jason, is. Post, Cuba, and the East Germans. Those happen. They're total failures uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the bureaucracy, of the organization. They happened. Simmons happened. That's a total failure of the bureaucracy. And see, why? I don't know. All I know is that my approach, HCCA, works. And whatever approach they're using... And I mean, I get your, I, I get your point. It's so much about context. Like, if somebody tells me that they grew up in a city that I grew up in, and they start saying certain things, instantly it resonates, right? Like, oh yeah, this thing, that thing, or culturally, or this place, or whatever it is. Somebody comes up to me and says, "Hey, I, you know, I, I used to be a mental health professional. What'd you do?" They start describing their job, and I'm like, "Yeah, that doesn't <laughs> sound like." mental health anywhere other than cuba or canada but um, yeah. so, so so what 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 happens is what what i believe happens is that the uh the, the agency doesn't use and doesn't appreciate hcca they use and have been duped by these physiological practitioners like um uh, uh, the micro expressions guy, anybody that's measuring body, anything about the body to detect deception. That's, that's the, 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 the organizational way to detect deception. And what that does is it de not, not delegitimizes, but it, 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 it takes away from what the approach I use, which is yeah. totally based on me. I am the, de- the 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 machine that detects deception, that assesses credibility, and the the system that created Coast East Germany and Cuba has taken that away from the individual case officers and put mm-hmm. the um the the the, 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 the power yeah. to the physiological measurement people. 
And what that does is the the human assessors say, you know, it doesn't matter what I do or say. It's all going to go to the physiological guys. So it's like you have a muscle that you never use. It's going to atrophy. So that's why all of these people have atrophied credibility assessment muscles, all of the ex-agency people that all the people that ran across him and saw him and didn't call him out to be as a fraud, it's because their credibility assessment muscle is atrophy. Yeah. I I get it. (laughs) Yeah. No, no, no. It makes complete sense to me. Or they never have it. Right. Or they never, never, they, well, it, it, it's never developed because you don't have to. So Michael's, and then we can wrap up. Michael's asking a question about any chance machine learning could figure things out, things like AI and other aspects. I mean, my off the gate is if you look at chat GPT 4 if you look at a lot of the other um, tools that use AI and even some other forms of machine learning that come in, I think the toughest things that they struggle with are exactly what you're saying, which is putting things in. AI or machine learning is doing is taking is is it's all based on uh, I, I forget the exact terminology, but it's based on huge databases of stuff that people have written. Yep, and it's language models. It's word association. Giant- right, yeah, yeah, or language model is what it's called. And all that means is is a huge database of things that people have written. So it's it's scanning through there and figuring out what is. What what's the word that comes next? What's the con- in this context using massive computing power? If you use machine, if you use these large language models to try to assess credibility, it's going to go out and find Ekman's stuff, and it's going to say, and it's going to find uh, natural language programming stuff, and it's going to find read oh, technique no, stuff, yeah. and. So garbage in, garbage out. There's right. No, there's no artificial. <laughs> yeah. There's it's no artificial intelligence uh, that that can detect deception. And and that's a, a a great point here is that there are companies that are blogging, selling this artificial intelligence facial analysis, and it's all based on Ekman stuff that it's supposedly. You know, they're, they, somebody in the EU has come up with uh, a, an airport uh, deception detection tool that's based on AI and that it scans the face and is looking for micro expressions. Totally useless. To- nope. Totally useless. It's been, <laughs> it doesn't work. And uh, I, can give you, I can give you an example from my real life. These uh, researchers... I can't remember if they're in North Carolina, Texas, somewhere south of me right now. But they, they did this analysis with their students of all of my writing. So everything I published in the New York Times, whether it's solid, whether it included fabrication and plagiarism. And they, they found this pattern in my writing. And at first I was like, BS, you're wrong. But they said a couple things. I would become less specific and more vague in my writing and more tentative in my writing. So humans did this and they did an analysis and eventually they're going to see, can we extrapolate this to other instances of this? But this is just Jason, right? And then they tried to have AI do the same kind of analysis. And it was a hot throwing incorrect mess where it identified stories that were perfectly fine as must be fabricated and ones that were just totally off the mark incorrectly. And that's what we have right now. But there are some limited spaces where like AI is really helpful. Code breaking, right? Trying to break codes like NSA has been doing it forever. It's not great at assessing humans. Humans, humans. You can't, uh, you know, if they're uh, trying to put Because code breaking is assessing itself. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, exactly. Trying yeah. to put AI on this problem is the the and the the problem is human uh human behavior, human communications it is the only way that could possibly work is if there are if looking to the right does actually means you're lying. 
if there was a micro expression that means something, but there aren't. <laughs> there, are, there are no physiological signals that uh, that, that that indicate deception, um, generically and across. Better, no better than flipping a coin. You can flip a coin in any case, and you'll get this. Uh, you just as likely to get the right answer as you are using any other approach. So, no AI ain't gonna work. I'm gonna. If there aren't any other questions, I'm gonna throw it to you. Oh wait, um, hold on. Just attempt to catch that. Yeah, no, no, no. I see exactly. It, one of the things Michael was just pointing out that is machine learning is trying to trying to address that challenge. I'm just I'm just highly skeptical of its ability to catch up in my lifetime or possibly any lifetime unless foundationally it moves away from uh using things like lang language models or to your point garbage in garbage out problem. Um so but I wanted to throw it to you, Kent, to see if there are anything, any closing advice you have for people, any thoughts you have for the future, what you're doing for Valentine's Day with your lovely wife, whatever you want. And she really is a lovely person. Thanks for me, Jason. I appreciate that. Say hi to her for me. She, I will do. She is, she's the uh, foundation of my success. <laughs> but without her, I wouldn't be where I am. Yeah. Uh, and And... Funnily enough, uh, we met on Valentine's Day. Did you really? Four, yeah, probably forty years ago. You guys met overseas, right? Or no, you, no, we went to school together school at Southern right. Illinois University. Oh, right. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Uh, well, I mean, I, I guess well, kind, kind of wrapped it up. A forty year. You better go check to find out yeah. whether it's the forty year. Like I said, I, I I know, like I have like a ten year window where I'm pretty sure <laughs> <laughs> you will have some work to do. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I pay for it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I I guess that kind of our, the theme of what we're we're talking about here is that. Uh, it's the, the the human interactions that's the human side is the most important piece of it's it's what my specialty is and in now that i do corporate counterintelligence i my specialty is the human side it's helping companies to understand that it's their humans are both their greatest strength and their greatest weakness if you don't empower them and you don't train them, uh, then they can be your greatest weakness. If they're empowered and trained, then they become naturally intelligent sensors that can observe the environment, report back into the system, and, uh, and, and we can develop a picture of what's happening and counter any potential threats. More than 90% of data breaches are caused by, or, or have, go back to a human. There's a human cause. Uh, the, the typical loss of data in a company is not uh, a hacker sitting in Romania typing code to get into your system. It's somebody manipulating your humans. Maybe it is a, a hacker in Romania, but he's manipulating your humans by getting on a dating website, by uh, by uh, meeting them on LinkedIn, by sending them an email. But it's the human side that's the key. And there's no shortcuts. There's no no physiological. There's no temp thermometer that you can stick in somebody's ear and tell if someone is lying or not. You have to. Be you have to understand the context that they're that they're living and working in, and you have to look at the whole picture, a holistic approach. Because when uh, yeah, when you when you say that, like part of what it makes me think of is that we spend a lot of time, whether it's in like interrogations or assessing credibility, doing a lot of like talking and trying these different tricks and approaches. But in reality, we should probably do a little bit more watching and listening and paying attention to things as opposed to trying to kind of force our way to answer. 
Yeah, but, that's a good way. I, I never never really thought about it like that. But when I when I do those things, uh, when when I'm gathering information, gathering details, gathering data, interviewing, debriefing, what you just described is how I do it. It's, uh, you know, in, instead of instead of looking at which way his legs are crossed or, you know, what is the baseline uh, of his uh, eye movements? I'm initiating conversations. I'm listening. I'm processing. I follow up. I uh, I, I summarize. I uh, elicit. I, I guide. But. Yeah, it's it's all about human interaction, and there's no no real technical trick to it except interacting with human humans a lot, <laughs> right? And well, a lot. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, Kent, thank you so much, man. Per usual, um, we're gonna let those of you guys who are on the chat go. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it, and. You know, hopefully we'll see some of you guys next week with uh, Julia. And hopefully for those of you guys who are interested, this is Kent's book. Um, it's kind of cool. I got a chance to, I haven't read it since it's published, but I got a chance to read it in its early versions. And I am excited about uh, him putting all these ideas that we've been talking about for years that I you know, at least in my experience as a journalist, as my experience as somebody who has deceived people, in my experience as somebody who's worked in mental health, they're really spot on in terms of, uh, you know, being able to assess what's credible and what's not. So, all right. Thanks, Jason. See you guys. Be good. Thanks, everybody. If you want to join us for more discussions with us and other listeners, we can be found on most social media platforms including a listener-run Facebook group called the Silver Linings Fireside Chat. For deeper conversations with our guests and live conversations with other listeners, you can also join us on our Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the Silver Linings Handbook. <laughs>